Hello and welcome to another live broadcast with MedStar Georgetown University Hospital. My name is Michelle Bowman Carter and today I'm joined by orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Brent Weasel, chief of shoulder and elbow surgery at MedStar Georgetown and his patient, Joy Freckling. At MedStar Georgetown, part of the MedStar Orthopedic Institute, we offer the most advanced care and treatment for rotator cuff, shoulder replacements and other painful shoulder conditions. We offer a variety of cutting edge procedures that benefit you with more precise surgery, faster recovery times, better pain management and better results. So if you'd like to learn more about shoulder pain and arthritis and diagnosis and treatment options available, stick around, share this broadcast with your friends and ask us your questions in the comments below. We're gonna take some time to answer those as well. So Dr. Weasel and Joy, thank you and welcome. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time today to join us. Uh, before we begin um, our discussion, Dr. Weasel, could you tell our viewers a little bit about yourself and your expertise as an orthopedic surgeon? Sure. So thanks for the introduction, Michal. Uh, my name is Brent Weasel. I'm an orthopedic shoulder surgeon here at MedStar Georgetown. I grew up in the Washington area, went to Georgetown University undergraduate, and then spent 10 years uh, training in first medical school and then orthopedics and then finally shoulder surgery. Uh, up in Philadelphia at the University of Pennsylvania and then the Rothman Institute. I've been back here at Georgetown uh, for about 15 years. Uh, my practice is 100% uh, shoulder and elbow surgery, really about 95% of that being shoulder surgery. Um, so it's a lot of rotator cuff repairs, a lot of shoulder replacements. And that's sort of what we do. Great, thank you. And thanks again for joining us. Um, so let's get started with a few of our questions. Um, I wanna delve into the anatomy of the shoulder and poss possible shoulder conditions that patients can experience. Uh, so first, uh, what makes up the shoulder joint? So when we talk about the shoulder joint, um, you know, it's more, more complex than really just one joint. Uh, we're gonna sort of model here, hopefully this will help a little bit. What we're talking about is not just the ball and socket joint that people typically think of as the shoulder. Uh, but the whole shoulder complex, which makes up the ball and socket joint there, as well as the collarbone here and the joint where that meets the top of the shoulder blade called the acromioclavicular joint. Uh, and then the shoulder blade itself, uh, which is held on um, to the back of your chest or, or your upper back um, by a series of muscles. Um, and you know, the shoulder more so than any joint in the body has a tremendous range of motion. But in order for that to happen, it means the joint itself is not particularly stable. So it really relies on the muscles around it, especially the muscles of the rotator cuff, to keep the ball part of this joint centered in the socket and let you move um, up and down and out to the side and sort of put your hand where you need it. Thank you for sharing and thanks for uh, having a visual uh, reference as well. I think it helps uh, uh, paint a better picture for us to visualize um, uh, the shoulder. Uh, so uh, what are the most common uh, causes of shoulder pain? So when we talk about shoulder pain, um, the, the sort of three most common things that we see vary by age. So in young patients, and by that I mean uh, patients generally under the age of uh, 35 or 40, um, the most common thing we'll see is a shoulder dislocation. And what that means is the actual ball here comes out of the socket. And depending on how old you are and how that happens, sometimes all that needs is some physical therapy to help stabilize the joint. Sometimes you need surgery to repair some of the ligaments that help hold the ball in the socket. Once you pass the age of 40, instability of the shoulder becomes much less common. And the most common thing we see are rotator cuff problems. And again, the rotator cuff is a series of muscles that help hold the ball in the socket and they run right underneath the top of the shoulder blade here. And so it's very common uh, for them to get worn down uh, by this bone here or just worn out from overuse and you can get tears um, in the rotator cuff. The third most common thing we see is shoulder arthritis. And that's uh, similar to arthritis in any other part of the body where the actual joint surface itself starts to wear out. And there's different things that can cause that in the shoulder, but arth arthritis in and of itself means that the actual lining of the joint, the cartilage lining that used to be a thousand times smoother than ice starts to look like a gravel road. That's a, a great segue to uh, my next set of questions about shoulder arthritis. Um, so could you uh, elaborate on what shoulder arthritis is and what are some of the common symptoms that patients should look out for? Yeah, absolutely. So 
When you talk about shoulder arth, we talk about arthritis in any joint. There's two main causes of arthritis. So one way that the cartilage lining can wear out uh, is something called inflammatory arthritis. And the most common type of, of inflammatory arthritis is rheumatoid arthritis. And that means that the body's own cells are attacking the cartilage surfaces and it essentially disintegrates. Uh, the great news with rheumatoid arthritis is, is orthopedic surgeons, we're now seeing much, much less of that because the medications we have to treat rheumatoid arthritis have gotten so much better in the past 20 years or so that that's becoming a much less common. It's still very, it's still prevalent, but most of the time the rheumatologists can treat that and patients never get bad enough that they get to the point where they need an orthopedic surgeon, which is a great thing for them. So the most common type of arthritis that we see as orthopedists is osteoarthritis. And that means that, that the actual joint surface is just worn out from wear and tear. It's sort of like the tires on your car going slowly bald. Um, in the shoulder, we do have a second type of wear and tear arthritis that we'll see. And that happens when your rotator cuff wears away. So instead of the ball sitting directly on the socket, um, like it is on the inside of this model here, you can imagine if that rotator cuff is gone, the ball no longer sits where it's supposed to, it sits right up here underneath the top of the shoulder blade. And once that happens, it's not sitting in the, the, the cup that was designed to hold it. And so that in and of itself will start to wear away the cartilage. And so in the shoulder, the most common types of arthritis we see are the osteoarthritis, the, the wear and tear, and then uh, rotator cuff related arthritis, which is called uh, rotator cuff tear arthropathy. All right, thank you. Um, so I, I know you, you mentioned that after, you know, as we age and as we go through just general wear and tear, that could uh, possibly lead to some of um, uh, some uh, pain and the shoulder arthritis ultimately. But could you uh, share uh, what other things could cause shoulder arthritis? So, uh, you know, there's several things that can, can lead to osteoarthritis or, or just traumatic degeneration of the joint. So a significant injury that leaves the joint no longer being smooth, most of the time a fracture can lead uh, to arthritis. It's very similar to osteoarthritis. We talked about inflammatory arthritis where the body attacks itself. And then that third category of the rotator cuff wearing out uh, and then the joint no longer um, sitting where it's supposed to. And that's, that's actually the type of arthritis uh, that Joy had, um, and maybe it'd be useful if she comes on and talks a little bit about uh, how that sort of presented and how that felt, and then I can sort of walk through how maybe some of the other uh, ones typically present. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Weasel, and thank you, Joy, again, for joining us and sharing your, uh, your story with us. Um, uh, guest, this is Joy Freckling, one of Dr. Weasel's patients. Um, so, Joy, could you walk us through your experience and share what were your, your symptoms initially. Sure. Um, my story is just a little bit different because it started about 12 years ago when I fell and tore the rotator cuff in 10 places on my left shoulder. And I had a surgery to repair it. Um, and it was, you know, it, it repaired it, but unfortunately I couldn't lift my arm any higher than, than this. Um, I'm right-handed, so it wasn't that big a deal. I continued to do everything with my right hand. But then about two years ago, I started having a bunch of symptoms in my right shoulder, which you know now sounds exactly like the osteoarthritis that Dr. Weasel is mentioning. And basically, after we tried a number of things, Dr. Weasel suggested that I have reverse shoulder replacement surgery and have it on my left arm, not my right arm, so that I could get more functionality in my left arm and not keep beating this poor arm and shoulder to death, as I had been doing for about 10 years. Wow. Yeah, that's quite a long period to, you know, use the right arm as opposed to, to both of your arms and, you know, and have that full range of motion. So thank you. Uh, thank you again, Joy. Um, Dr. Weasel, could you share how uh, shoulder arthritis is diagnosed? So sure. So Joy's story is a little bit unusual in that she had a sort of single traumatic injury and then it um, spiraled a little bit after that. Most people uh, who present with arthritis in the shoulder will have a gradual 
decrease in function and increase in pain. They'll also, they'll often notice some clicking uh, or catching. And again, that's the, those surfaces that used to be very smooth, now looking like a gravel road and catching on each other. Um, and then they typically will notice decreased range of motion. So um, if it's a rotator cuff problem, often as Joy sort of described, you can't get your arm up over your shoulder level or sometimes even up above your waist. If it's osteoarthritis where the rotator cuff is okay, then they'll be able to get the arm up, but they just sort of lose motion in all directions. So they notice they can't get it behind their back. They can't reach out to the side very well, and then eventually lose the ability sort of to, to get it up as well. And so once those people come in, the diagnosis of arthritis is typically made most of the time, actually with nothing fancy, just a simple x-ray because the x-ray will show that joint space between the two bones is gone. And then you actually will start to make some extra bone there that's very characteristic of the arthritis or of arthritis. So that, that's most of the time all we need to make the diagnosis. Okay, thank you. Uh, could you uh, share the differences between uh, arthritis and rotator cuff problems? Sure, so I mean, uh, so arthritis is the, is means that you're wearing out the actual lining of the joint. Um, and as you start to get older, that can happen. We've talked about some other reasons why that can happen. The rotator cuff problem means that you're starting to wear away the, those rotator cuff muscles um, that help stabilize the ball in the socket. And so those patients, uh, most of the time, will not lose nearly as much motion as the arthritic patients. They tend to have more weakness in that they can't get the, the arm up, not because it won't go, whereas an arthritic patient, they just simply can't go past here. It's like trying to move a immovable object. Somebody with a big rotator cuff tear will have no problem if somebody else lifts their arm up there. They just can't get it on their own because they don't have the muscle strength there. Now, I guess this, those, those roads sort of converge towards the end because if a rotator cuff tear gets big enough, uh, like in Joy's case, then it will go on to, to cause you some arthritis as well. Thank you. Thank you for um, explaining that. Um, so uh, can physical therapy help with shoulder arthritis? So early on, uh, therapy can help. Uh, in the case of uh, patients that have rotator cuff tear related arthritis, uh, if we strengthen the remainder, remaining rotator cuff, sometimes they can get enough function that it, it at least pulls that ball closer back to where it's supposed to go. And so it works better. Uh, in osteoarthritic patients where it's just wear and tear, the arthritis or excuse me, physical therapy can sometimes help to get some of their range of motion back and make them a little bit more functional, especially if their arm's very, very stiff. Um, but it never cures the process in the sense that uh, other than a shoulder replacement, we don't have any way to go back and, and make the cartilage that's lining the joint regrow. Gotcha. Um, are there uh, any medications that could also be helpful for treating uh, shoulder arthritis? Yeah, and so in addition to the physical therapy, uh, often anti-inflammatory medication, so Advil or Aleve, or there's some prescription ones as well, can help calm down uh, some of that inflammation and let patients uh, live with it. Um, and sometimes cortisone injections can help uh, in addition to that. And arthritis in the shoulder is a little bit different than in the hip and the knee in the sense that once we see significant arthritis in the hip and the knee and it's bothering people, fairly predictably, that goes on and gets worse uh, as time goes on. And a lot of those patients, the majority of them will end up needing either hip or knee replacements, depending on which joint we're talking about. In the shoulder, because we don't walk on it, uh, there are a lot of people that can have a lot of arthritis in their shoulder and they're able to compensate for it very well and sometimes with some physical therapy, sometimes with some of the medications, go on and live and not have any problems. There's others um, where it will progress much quicker and end up needing a shoulder replacement. Thank you, Dr. Weasel. Um, I wanna turn back to you, uh, Joy, again. Uh, could you share uh, more of your experience with the non-surgical treatments for uh, shoulder arthritis, like physical therapy? Sure. Um, yeah, I've done physical therapy exercises ever since I, I had the shoulder problem. And sometimes I go to physical therapy. Lots of times I've just, I've done it for so long that I just do it at, at, 
at home. Um, and the other thing that I've done is there are some creams that I've used to put on that, you know, makes it feel better. Um, I think maybe it's kind of like it's a placebo. It just gives me a sense that I'm doing something and I'm not just sitting there de deteriorating. Um, but obviously it, it didn't solve the problem physically, although psychologically it may, it may have made me feel like I'm more in control. <laughs> thank, thank you for, for sharing, uh, Joy. Um, I, if, and, oh, I think, ahead, Dr. I, was gonna say, I think in Joy's case, you know, obviously it didn't help uh, on the left side, but her right side has, um, you know, this is how we first met, this is what she first came to see me about, has a fair amount of arthritis and some rotator cuff problems. And uh, she was very dedicated with physical therapy for that and has quite good function over there. Yeah, and I'm still, I still do it every day for about 20 minutes, you know, various kinds of exercise. And, you know, that's me, I guess. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Uh, well, thank you both for sharing. Um, to our audience, if you're just joining us, thank you for tuning in. Uh, today, we are discussing shoulder arthritis and treatments with orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Brent Weasel, and one of his patients, Joy Freckling. So far, we've talked about shoulder anatomy and, um, the, how shoulder arthritis presents itself, some common symptoms and things to look out for. Um, we also heard about Joy's uh, personal experience with shoulder arthritis, but we have more to cover. Uh, so keep watching, share this broadcast with your friends, give us a like to let us know that you're here and share your questions and comments uh, below. We're gonna take some time to answer those as well in a few minutes. Um, so continuing with some of my questions, um, Dr. Weagle, could you share when uh, shoulder replacement is needed, at what point should someone seek this treatment? So that's really a question of how much it hurts you. Um, there are some other conditions in the shoulder where we'll tell you you need to have surgery because if you don't, it's going to get worse. In the case of arthritis, it's really almost always a case of the patient saying, I, I can't live with this anymore. Um, a lot of times, uh, the thing that'll push them over the edge is when they can't sleep at night, um, when they're having pain that wakes them up from sleep. Uh, that's often, you know, precipitates most people to say, hey, and now, now I think it's the time. Um, so it, it, this is one where people can have really bad looking x-rays and I can walk in the room thinking that they they're going to tell me they need a shoulder replacement. They say, hey, this feels great. I'm just here to check on how it's doing. And sometimes we have the other case where the x-rays don't look as bad and it really bothers them. And that's, it's, this is one where it's the patient's symptoms, not anything that we see on exam or on x-ray that, that tells us it's time. All right. So see, that's very important to pay attention to your body and what it's trying to tell us, you know, what depending on where we feel pain or discomfort. So thank you, Dr. Weasel. Um, also, why are there uh, two types of shoulder replacement? Could you uh, share the two types and uh, different, differentiate between the two? Yeah, absolutely. And so this is where shoulder replacement surgery has really come a tremendous ways in the last 20 years, I'd say. So up until 20 years ago, uh, we really had one type of shoulder replacement, and that was something called an anatomic shoulder replacement. And this is an, an example of one. So you have a metal ball here, um, you know, a metal stem that goes down the arm, and then a metal ball that replaces uh, the normal ball of the humerus. And then on the, the shoulder blade side, uh, we put in a little plastic socket. I mean, you can see this thing's pretty small, um, but that's what goes in there. And essentially, we're resurfacing that joint. Uh, and this is very similar to what we do in the hip or the knee. We just resurface the joint. So the problem with this is in order for this to work, uh, you really need to have a functioning rotator cuff around it. Because just like in the normal shoulder, uh, you can see how small the socket is compared to the ball. You, you got to have the rotator cuff to help stabilize that ball in the socket and then let you move the, the bigger muscles of the shoulder move the arm. And there are a number of cases, uh, Joy's uh, being one of them is as well as even end stage arthritis where you've worn away a lot of the bone where that rotator cuff's really not there or not functioning well. And uh, up until 20 years ago, we didn't have much of a solution to that. At this point, we do have a different device that we use and we're actually using it more and more sort of as time goes on called a reverse shoulder replacement. And what that means is instead of 
putting the ball on the ball side and the socket on the socket side, we put the socket on the ball side. So you can see here, very similar looking stem that goes down the arm, but it's got a plastic cup on it. So this is now the socket side. And then on the shoulder blade side, uh, in a real implant, this would be made out of metal, but the, the metal comes in a bunch of different pieces. So it's easier to show you in plastic, but we put this plate um, with screws into your socket side, and then we put a, a metal ball on it. And so these two pieces fit together much better than a regular shoulder replacement. And so they let you compensate both for arthritis as well as for not having a rotator cuff. Um, so in a case like Joy's where your arthritis was caused by not having a rotator cuff, this is really the only option. And we're actually learning uh, as we get more and more familiar with this device that even in people that have wear and tear arthritis with an intact rotator cuff, that just like as you get older, you'll start to see more rotator cuff problems with a shoulder replacement as it's been in there for a long time, you'll start to see that rotator cuff wear away. So there's a lot of times when this device makes sense, uh, even with an intact rotator cuff. And so this, this has really changed. Um, the regular shoulder replacement is a great device in, in, in younger patients with arthritis. And that, I mean, pe people in their 40s and 50s, that's still our go-to operation. But certainly uh, even middle-aged patients in their 70s and beyond now, we're starting to move much more towards reverse shoulder replacement. Okay. Thank you. Thank you again for the visual aids. I think that that really helps people get a picture of what's going on um, beneath the surface. So thank you very much for that. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's very hard to say a reverse replacement until you can actually see what that looks like. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so once, once a patient has had um, shoulder replacement surgery, uh, what does the recovery look like? So it depends a little bit in, ter in terms of which one we do, um, but okay. with either replacement, uh, typically you're in the hospital for one night afterwards. Um, sometimes uh, you can go home the same day, uh, but either way, uh, certainly uh, home by the, the first day after surgery. And then you're going to be in a sling um, with a reverse replacement for about three weeks. And then we have you come out and start using the arm. And depending on how you're doing at six weeks, you may need some physical therapy. You may not. About 50% of people will need some therapy. 50% won't. With an anatomic shoulder replacement, so the old standard replacement, the recovery takes a little bit longer. So we have to detach one of the rotator cuff muscles in the front to put that in. And for that device, we need that to heal. So we have to protect it. So for six weeks, you're in a sling. During that time, we have you in physical therapy where they're moving the arm for you a little bit. And then starting at six weeks, we bring you out of the sling. And then you need, with that one, most of the time, about two to three months of physical therapy. All right. Thank you, Dr. Weasel. Uh, Joy, I want to turn back over to you. Um, earlier, you shared your experience with the non-surgical treatments for shoulder arthritis. Um, so could you uh, share at this time what your experience was like after having shoulder replacement surgery? Sure. Um, well, first, first of all, the surgery and the recovery itself wasn't that big a deal. It was, you know, it was an in, inconvenience but I wouldn't say it was traumatic or, or terribly upsetting. It just was one of the things you, you get through. Um, when I got through the three weeks and the whatever weeks afterwards, um, I guess the next three weeks, my arm was still um, not functioning the way we wanted it to be. So I did go into physical therapy and um, I don't know, I would say I went into physical therapy in the end of August, the beginning of se September. And by February or March of the next year, I really had gained a whole lot of functionality back. Um, so I think um, the biggest challenge was being patient and letting the healing and the physical therapy do its course. But honestly, I never thought I would be thrilled, thrilled to be able to take a parking ticket and stick it into the, <laughs> into the machine with my left hand and get it back out. I couldn't do that for 10 years, you know, and every once in a while I have this kind of, my God, I couldn't do that before. You know, you begin right. to take for granted things that were impossible. So I'm happy. 
<laughs> awesome. Awesome. And you have, you know, full range of motion now. How, do, how does it feel now um, after having that experience? Um, well, you know, if it, you know, I, I have some old lady aches and pains, but, um, you know, I, I, it works. So I'm happy. <laughs> That's what we like to hear. <laughs> awesome. Hey. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Weasel? Well, I say, I think there's two things Joy said there that are, are very common with arthritic patients. And one is that uh, the surgery doesn't hurt nearly as much as they think it's going to. Um, mm -hmm. And part of that's because they've been living with pain for so long that patients with a shoulder replacement, a lot of times when they wake up, um, before they even go home from the hospital, they say, geez, this feels better than this thing's felt in years. Um, certainly by the time they come back in at 10 days, most people are feeling much, much better. And the, I think the other thing she sort of touched on is it does tend to be somewhat of a gradual process. And so a lot of people don't realize exactly how much it was hurting or how much they're not able to do until after they get it fixed. And so shoulder replacement, because it was developed a little bit later than hip and knee replacement, has had sometimes gets a, a bad name because people who aren't familiar with it in the past 30 years will say, oh, it doesn't work very well. And they're right. In the 1970s, we were just really learning how to do it in the 1980s. And it, it worked, but it doesn't work nearly as well as it did uh, today. And so they'll just say, oh, this could, you should just live with it. And they sort of have this gradual deterioration in function. Once they get it done, I've had a lot of patients who look at me and say, well, what, why didn't you tell me to do this you know, five or 10 years ago? <laughs> why, why, why were you holding this out? And I said, well, I told you that. And, and you told me you didn't need it. So um, it, it is something that, that works well. And you, there are, it's, it's a tool we've gotten. So there's no reason to really give up a tremendous amount of function if there's a possibility of getting it back. So that's good to hear, especially it, it, it makes sense that over time, technology has gotten better. We're able to pinpoint the exact area where someone is experiencing pain and, and, and alleviate that pain. So um, I think that's, that's really good to hear. Um, so at this time, I'd like to address some of the questions that we received from our viewers on social media. Um, so if, you're, uh, if you still have some questions that you'd like to share, uh, please share those below in the comments. Um, so I have a question for Dr. Weasel. This comes from, uh, from Rick, and bear with me with the technical terms um, that he is, uh, he's gonna mention. So he says, a full thickness uh, supraspinatus tear on my left shoulder is my diagnosis. I've done almost a year of physical therapy and nothing has changed with regard to the pain. Uh, the pain is excru excruciating during the night. Um, I feel much better once uh, moving around um, during the day, but still he has pain 24 uh, seven. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Weasel, uh, what recommendations do you have for Rick? So, so that's changing topics a little bit um, because okay. that sounds like that's more of a sort of a small uh, to medium sized rotator cuff tear that should be repairable. Um, and certainly if you have a full thickness uh, tear of your rotator cuff, uh, you should see a shoulder surgeon because that's something you may want to think about uh, having fixed. Um, okay. Sounds like what you've, you've done hasn't helped. And if it is a repairable tear, it's something you want to think about fixing. If it's not repairable and it's bothering you that much, then that may be a time when you want to think about a reverse shoulder replacement. Okay, great. Thank you. And thank you, Rick, for sharing your question. Um, but I have, Rick, there I is, there's certainly something that you can get done for that. And, and that is, as opposed to when we talked about arthritis, which is not time sensitive in the sense that we wait until the symptoms and the patient says, hey, this is when I want to do it. Mm -hmm. Once you have a full thickness rotator cuff tear, it's a little bit like a tear on a bed sheet. So it, it mechanically is much easier for it to get bigger with time. So if you leave that full thickness tear alone, it's likely to get worse and become less repairable and do less well with surgery. Okay. So uh, essentially time is of the essence, like the sooner that he can get care, the better we Okay. Yeah, so it's not a it's not an emergency. You don't need to run out and see somebody this afternoon, but you ought to see somebody. You know, a year's a long time. A year's a long time to live with being that unhappy, regardless, exactly. and and something you ought to see somebody about. All right. Thank you, Doctor Weasel. Um, I have a question from uh, Joanne. She says, "I have extreme bad shoulder discomfort when I move my arm certain ways." 
uh, for three, this has been going on for three months. Um, she's had an x-ray that said, um, came out as bursitis. Um, I will not get a needle in there. They gave me exercises to do at home and wanted me to go to uh, physical therapy, uh, but it absolutely um, hasn't gotten better at all. Uh, she's okay when she's sleeping, uh, but uh, it just takes her breath away with certain movements. So um, I'm imagining she's she is having excruciating pain during these certain movements. Uh, so uh, Dr. Weasel, do you have any recommendations, any uh, suggestions for the care that she should uh, seek out? Well, it sounds like you may have a rotator cuff problem and, and may want to think about that injection because it does tend to be very effective for that and often can help you avoiding surgery. Um, but if that's not something you want to think about at all, uh, you certainly should talk to your doctor about possibly getting an MRI scan and, and seeing exactly what's going on there uh, if you had a normal x-ray and go from there. Okay. Awesome. Uh, we have a uh, question um, from Annette, who wants to know uh, more about the relationship between uh, tendinitis of the shoulder and rheumatoid arthritis in the neck. Is there any connection there, Dr. Weasel? So uh, rheumatoid arthritis in the neck or rheumatoid arthritis in general? Um, specifically in the, in the neck, I think is um, what she's, she's having. So, uh, you know, so rheumatoid arthritis, uh, that tends to attack the whole body. Um, so it's an inflammatory process that's sort of everywhere. If it's worse than the neck, um, then it can be difficult to distinguish between uh, shoulder problems and neck problems because the shoulder does tend, uh, they're, they're so close together that when your shoulder's hurting you, you'll start to use your shoulder, you'll start to move your shoulder blade more, um, which will then put more stress up on your neck. And then vice versa, if your neck is hurting, it's very common to get pain referred down uh, into the shoulder and even sometimes into the arm and into the hand. So um, that's sort of the relationship between the two. They, they're right there next to each other. They obviously go hand in hand uh, and it really depends on which one's worse. Often if it's rheumatoid arthritis, it's bothering both of them. And so if you can get some better control of that with the rheumatologist, it may make both, both problems better. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Weasel. Um, I have a question about um, who should, who would be the best candidate for, for surgery. So can patients of any age get rotator cuff surgery? So that, that's an interesting question. It, it depends. Um, we know that the older you get, uh, the less likely the rotator cuff is to heal. Um, so it really depends first on what the condition your rotator cuff looks like and uh, then how healthy you are and how big and how long your tear has been there. A little bit what we talked about before. Um, so I've done rotator cuff repairs in people in their 90s and had them do great. Um, we'll sometimes see people in their 60s and 70s that have, a, a, or even younger than that, that have a big enough rotator cuff tear that we can't fix it. And we need to talk about a reverse shoulder replacement for that. All right, we have uh, another question. This one comes from uh, Steve, who asks, uh, what is the difference between tendinitis of the shoulder and arthritis of the shoulder in terms of the causes and treatments? So tendinitis is a problem, again, uh, with that rotator cuff, um, the tendons of the rotator cuff, as opposed to arthritis, which is a problem of the joint surface itself. And so if it's isolated tendinitis or early uh, rotator cuff tear. Tendinitis most of the time can get better with a combination of with physical therapy, sometimes with the addition of a cortisone injection. If there's a tear of the rotator cuff and it's early on and it's small, then most of the time you'll need surgery. Uh, it's a full tear to fix that, um, but that will make that better. Arthritis is wearing out of that joint surface. And so we can do some things to symptomatically make you feel better in terms of the anti-inflammatory medicine, sometimes some injection of, some, of cortisone into the joint itself physical therapy like we talked about before. Um, but the only thing that solves that problem is a shoulder replacement where we reline the joint. Thank you, Dr. Weasel. Uh, we have another, a uh, few other questions. Um, one about frozen shoulder. I think you may have uh, talked about this a little earlier in the broadcast, but could you elaborate on, on what that is and um, if there's any, any treatment necessary for that? Yeah, absolutely. So, so frozen shoulders, uh, 
fairly common um, and it's something that's often confused with arthritis because for wear and tear arthritis, glenohumeral arthritis, that will often present with pain and decreased range of motion. Uh, the other thing that will present with pain and decreased range of motion is frozen shoulder. The difference is on the x-ray in somebody with arthritis, you'll see the arthritis. So you'll see the destruction of the joint. And in their case, there's no amount of physical therapy that's going to restore all of their range of motion. You might be able to make it a little bit better, but uh, there's a, a mechanical block essentially stopping that. Frozen shoulder is a process where the lining of the shoulder joint gets inflamed and you get a progressive decreased range of motion of the shoulder. The good news with it is it almost never needs surgery. Uh, the bad news with it is it can take a long time to get better. And the average duration of symptoms is about 12 to 18 months. And so most of the time, the treatment consists of physical therapy early on to try and prevent as much motion loss as possible. And then once the process moves along to allow that range of motion to come back. And it's more common in women than men, uh, typically in uh, their 40s to about their 70s, uh, and also uh, much more common and more severe in uh, patients with either diabetes or problems with their thyroid. Okay. All right, thank you, Dr. Weasel. Um, I'm just curious, I have a, a, a certain relatives who have had um, what I would call shoulder arthritis. Um, uh, are there any occupations or, or um, different activities that would make someone more prone to experiencing this down the line? Um, what, what do you say about that? Yeah, so, so with all arthritis, we're not entirely sure what causes it. Um, there's no question that if you put a lot of wear and tear on your joints, you're more likely to get it. Um, okay. But then we know people, um, you know, you take the, the hip or the knee as an example, we know people that are marathon runners into their 80s and don't have any arthritis in their shoulder, mm -hmm. or excuse me, any arthritis in their hip or their knees. Um, and same thing um, in the shoulder, the only time, the only activity that we, we know for sure causes arthritis in the shoulder is power weightlifting. Um, and that's, uh, folks who have essentially taken their shoulder joint, which is not designed to be a weight bearing joint and make it into a weight bearing joint. And so they will, and they're typically, um, it's, it's typically males because they just got to lift a lot of weight. Um, will get a bad arthritis in their thirties and forties. Um, mm. short of that, there's no activity that we know of for sure that causes arthritis. Um, uh, the more sort of wear and tear you put on the shoulder, the bigger your risk for it, but it's probably some combination of uh, your genetics and then the activities that you do. Then there are people that have traumatic injuries that will get post-traumatic arthritis. That's sort of a different, um, different entity because what happens there is you have a normal shoulder, but you damage it with an injury and that leaves the joint not quite normal. And so over time, it will deteriorate. Okay. All right, thank you, Dr. Weasel. Um, I have another question um, about post-surgery. So what do you do for patients who may be experiencing pain after uh, shoulder surgery? Yeah, so I mean, we, we try and really uh, use as little narcotics these days as possible. Um, so when I do surgery, everybody does get a general anesthesia. So they do go to sleep because we're operating uh, right up next to your head. Um, mm -hmm. but we do typically do a nerve block ahead of time, um, which helps quite a bit with the pain for the first 12 to 24 hours. And then after that, we may use a little bit of narcotic pain medicine, uh, but often uh, a lot of Tylenol and anti-inflammatory medicine combined uh, with uh, either ice or ice in a compression sleeve uh, to, to help people. And most people don't need um, medication for more than a few days. Joy, what was your experience in terms of the pain after surgery? Yeah, I'm, tr I'm actually trying to remember. I know I took like extra strength Tylenol and um, I did have some narcotics, which I saved some for an emergency, um, but I didn't, I didn't take them for very, very long. And it, it, it really was um, acceptable. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Uh, thank you for, for sharing. We have a few more questions. Um, this one comes uh, from Bonnie um, talk, uh, talking about frozen shoulder again. So she says, um, I have a frozen shoulder and have been in PT for several months. Um, her doctor said that she will probably, probably have to have shoulder replacement surgery at some point. 
Um, she's also a golfer and hasn't been able to play uh, since she has had this problem. So when can she play golf <laughs> is her, main, her last question. But um, in her case, what would you uh, recommend for her? So that, that sounds like it may be a little bit of a confusing picture because if you have arthritis in the shoulder, um, which is what the diagnosis would be if you were talking about a shoulder replacement, you can't really have frozen shoulder. So in order to have a frozen shoulder, it has to be a normal joint. If it's not a normal joint, then there's another reason for the stiffness. So frozen shoulder is sort of stiffness that occurs in the normal joint and is an entity in and of itself. So if your stiffness is related to arthritis, then unfortunately, most of the time, there's no amount of therapy that's going to make it better, um, right, right. you know, may get slightly better. But good news is if you're able to play golf, uh, there's no problem with pushing through it. So you're not going to do more damage by with either frozen shoulder or arthritis. If you're able to play golf, it doesn't hurt you too much to do it. You by all means are fine to play. Okay. All right, Bonnie, I hope that helps. Um, we have a question from, uh, from Steve who says, uh, when is shoulder arthritis treatable with uh, just physical therapy? Are there specific um, exercises dependent upon where in the shoulder you, you feel the pain or what muscles are involved? So uh, early on shoulder arthritis, you know, we can improve some range of motion and often make people feel better with physical therapy. Um, in terms of what muscles specifically you're targeting, uh, it depends because in arthritis, the problem is not a muscle, it's that joint surface itself. Um, if it's a rotator cuff problem, then there's certainly very specific exercises depending on what the problem is to help make it better. All right, uh, thank you very much. We have uh, one last audience question from uh, Miriam um, that I wanna share. Uh, she's asking, is frozen shoulder related to arthritis? I, I remember we, we delved uh, deeper into what shoulder, what frozen shoulder is, but could you share if that's um, related to arthritis? Sure. No, there's frozen shoulder and arthritis are, are independent. And you actually can't have a frozen shoulder if you have arthritis. Um, but uh, as far as we know, frozen shoulder does not go on to cause arthritis, which is a, a good thing. Most people with frozen shoulder, it will resolve 100% within uh, 18 months or so. All right, thank you, Dr. Weasel. Um, are there um, any educational resources that you can provide for patients or that you um, would recommend for people who are having either shoulder pain or shoulder arthritis? Sure. I mean, we have some more information on our website. Uh, if you go on the MedStar Health website and then look up my name, uh, we've got several educational videos that we've done uh, on there, um, as well as some patient stories that can be useful. Uh, the other place, it's a, a good place to look, and you have to be a little careful looking for health information on the internet, but the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons has a website called OrthoInfo, so it's O-R-T-H-O-I-N-F-O, um, that has, that, that's verified information. So every, and that, that covers not just shoulder arthritis, but actually all, you know, hips, knees, all orthopedic problems. Um, it's a nice place to look for orthopedic stuff because it's been reviewed by multiple orthopedic surgeons and may not match up exactly with what your doctor's telling you, in which case you should, should trust your doctor, uh, but gives you some nice pictures and gives you a general sense of the approach to whatever the problem is. Great, great, thank you very much. Um, so as we close, I wanna turn back to Joy. Um, what message uh, do you have for patients who are suffering from uh, shoulder pain or sh shoulder arthritis? Well, I think I said this to Dr. Weasel at my last checkup and I'd say it anytime, I waited too long. I should have just gone ahead and done it, you know, um, after I discovered that, you know, my, my, my shoulder had lost the functionality. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't do it sooner. Thank you very much. Thank you again for sharing your story as well, Joy. I think it was, it was really helpful. Um, so that wraps up our broadcast. Uh, thank you to Dr.